Do you think that you recognize your strengths or how was it other people kind of helping you identify? I definitely think when people give you a compliment, like I'm the last person to be able to receive a compliment well. Like, right. <laughs> What does growth look like in the, in the ghostwriting world? People who pick a word of the year where okay. you jump in instead of having like a New Year's resolution. Right. You pick your word that you're going to focus on. We as a society are exhausted. Like there's so much heavy stuff going on, right? Yeah. And so this year, I want to approach things with kindness, expecting the best in others and seeing the positives in others. When people talk about the fear of AI taking over their jobs, especially in copywriting, yeah. um, you know, with the the emergence of things like chat GPT and things, mm -hmm. what what's going to separate copywriters and allow them to continue to A, keep their jobs? In the corporate world, People are afraid of losing their jobs because people, AI is coming and it's gonna make jobs obsolete in certain industries, in certain areas. That I cannot speak to. I'm specifically and purposefully not part of the corporate world. <laughs> the common thread is we all use it enough to be able to recognize it where we see it and we're like, oh my gosh, this is not good. When people are creating entire courses and they're like, oh, I used AI, I hardly had to work. And I'm like, yeah, but we're reading your course and the person on the other end of that who is paying for that course is not getting what they deserve. Hey everyone, thanks for joining this week on In Pursuit of Better. Today I'm talking to Michelle Beers, who is a copywriter and marketing uh, consultant. But I really wanted to dive into the conversation with her regarding AI and what that means for the future of copywriting business what the idea of copywriting or ghostwriting even is and what it's going to be going forward. So I think this is going to be a really cool conversation um, in the midst of everything that's going on with AI and chat GPT to find out from someone who is in that, that realm and in that space to see her perspective on, on things that are to come. So without further ado, let's dive into the conversation with Michelle. All right, Michelle, I can't thank you enough for, for joining today. We've already uh, kind of dove into a bunch of subjects and got off topic uh, beforehand, but wanted to give you a chance to kind of introduce yourself. Tell us what it is that you do and why you do it. I'm uh, Michelle Beers. Um, I am a content marketer, uh, developer, and strategist for Michelle Beers Collaborative Content Solutions. Um, and my goal and my mission essentially is to build connections and communities um, through copywriting and content marketing and helping bring that human aspect in um to to people's businesses and their brands and help really reinforce that connection that they create among their own communities how did you get started in this business i mean i know that you were a teacher before but how, yep. how did you make this jump to, to doing um this? well you know when you're a kid and you think about what you want to be when you grow up i wanted to be a writer and I also wanted to be a teacher and I also wanted to be like a veterinarian and all a hundred million things. And the path of least resistance was becoming a teacher. I had family members who were in education and I think in hindsight, it was the best choice for me because that's where I learned how to create community and connection and collaboration. And I realized sort of how my brain works and how to recognize the needs of others and kind of fill those needs. And so fast forward 15 years, I was burned out from teaching. I have a child at home who has special needs. I myself have chronic illness. I was just like frazzled. And <laughs> this was just before COVID. So mm -hmm. the winter break before 2020, I had a wonderful winter break home with my son. And I kind of just had that aha moment of something has to change. And I talked to my husband and I was like, I've got to, I've got to stop because I am burned out. My health is suffering. What can I do? So I kind of sat down and talked with him. I was like, I've always loved writing. I've kind of done some writing to make some extra money. I think I can figure this out. I think I can figure out a way to make that something that brings in enough revenue. And then if it doesn't work, I can substitute teach because I loved the teaching part. I loved that connection part and that watching people grow and connect. 
I didn't love all the other stuff that came with it. And as a substitute, like you don't have to deal with it. You go, <laughs> you can hang out with kids and then you go home. Yeah. Um, and so kind of, I didn't really intend on like launching this business. Um, and then COVID happened and that was a blessing because I was able to really work on myself and work in my business and kind of see my skill set and how I could apply that, kind of try everything and realize what I liked, what I didn't like, um, learn, you know, the hard way. I, that's how I learned by trying it and failing yeah. and adjusting. And so just slowly I developed that, that business. I started reaching out to friends and people I know and saying, Hey, this is a new venture I'm going into. And that's how it started. It was that I never once cold pitched anybody. I never once put out a, a cold email. It was all referrals. And I figured out a way to start connecting in my network, in my community, and just start building that network. And the thing about COVID is we were all kind of home. And there was this explosion of all of us connecting online all of a sudden, even brick and mortar businesses. And so it was like just the right time. Um, and so I grew that into what I do now, which is really essentially I kind of did everything. And then I, I rolled it back to mostly ghostwriting, content strategy, and um, a little bit of you know, projects for the clients that I still love that I, yeah. I kind of wouldn't do for other people. For, for example, I work um, in the podcast space for one client that I don't think I would offer that, but it's about the people that you work with. And I just was really lucky to get connected with people who had the right energy and had those same goals that gave me the energy to want to keep pushing forward and just learn and figure it out. And so here we are. <laughs> what, if, what does... This is a vague question, but what does like mm -hmm. ghostwriting or copywriting mean? Like what are you, what specifically are you writing? Okay. That's a good question because <laughs> there is so much that you can do with this skill. Um, so I started by essentially ghostwriting for a corporate uh, CEO <laughs> okay. and he was my very first client. And actually I stayed with him until earlier this year. Um, and essentially I was writing articles in his voice and I was writing content in his voice and putting out product with his voice and his goals and his values, but in a way that connected with people. And a lot of the people that I work with are wonderful speakers. They right. just can't put it into words. I'm the reverse. Okay. I trip over articulating what I'm trying to say, but I have the language to write it really clearly, concisely and create those connections. So copywriting is essentially writing to sell something, a product or a service. And content is, I mean, it, it's not just writing. Obviously, there's video content. There's all right. kinds of content. But you're creating a connection with your community. Um, and what our job is to do as writers is to really hone in on who that community is and exactly what they need and use the precise language to help them feel seen is you talk a lot about connecting and mm -hmm. you said when you were little, you always wanted to be a writer. Was yeah. this because writing was your way of connecting with people? Yep. Does that, Cause I'm trying to like, for me, like you just said, I'm the talker. Like I can talk yep. to people, but when I write it down, my wife would be like, Jordan, you don't, that's, you need a comma here. That's not a sentence. I'm like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> that's just how I talk. Yep. Um, but that's interesting to me that writing you talk about writing and connecting is it like you get to tell a story what is it for you that's like yes. feels like you're connecting I think there's a difference between like what your skills are what your natural skills and talents are and I think yeah. writing is a natural skill that just feels easy and it feels good and it feels intuitive my talent is connecting people and collaborating and so when you bring your skills to meet your talents then you create something really really strong um and then you know, you build in the additional things that you need, the additional resources that you need to make that happen. Was there fear on your part of, oh, of yeah. diving into to the business side? Because one thing, and one of the reasons I did this this podcast was like, I had that same thing. Like growing up, it's like, I wanted, I felt like I wanted to do a hundred different things. And it's like, I don't know if that was me being a people pleaser, like, here's what you should do. Here's the path you should take. But for a lot of people, on the outside looking in, it can look like people have this linear path to success. Mm -hmm. and that's rarely the case. So 
you have to be open to those opportunities, but being open also means, at least for me, it's like that, that can be scary. So what yes. fear did you have whenever you were thinking about, well, I'm going to make this jump, leave a full-time stable career and do this. I'm never not a little bit afraid. <laughs> like, but that's good. And that's the thing. And you need to be able to do things scared. And I had to really dig deep. And that's why I think I taught until I literally like my body was like, you have to stop because I was afraid. I was afraid to try something new. Teaching was easy. The teaching piece was something I loved to do. I knew I couldn't sustain it for about three years before I actually made the jump. And I kind of have realized looking back, being uncomfortable means you're growing, right? If you're comfortable, Mm -hmm. you're probably done doing whatever you're doing in that space. And it's time to up level, right? And I think that there's two reasons we feel uncomfortable, right? One, we're trying something new and we're scared. Or two, something's not aligned and it doesn't feel right. And so to be able to differentiate one from the other, I was not aligned with teaching anymore. It didn't feel right and it didn't feel good. Now I was trying this new thing and I was scared as hell, but I was excited and I had this energy. And so it's like just understanding where your energy is going And, you know, there's that saying that, well, I don't know if it's a saying, but there's an idea that our bodies feel nervous in the same way that it feels excitement. So whenever I feel nervous, Mm. I try to switch my mindset and go, I'm not nervous about this. I'm excited. And yeah, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I I can't get past that nervousness (laughs) and I shake and maybe my voice shakes a little bit like public speaking. I would rather die, but it's (laughs) something that I know will grow me. Right. And there's certain things that if I could, I would honestly like sit in my little room, just talk to my clients one-on-one and no one would ever know I exist, Mm. but I can't run a business that way. I have to put myself out there. I have to make connections and I love connecting with the right people. My fear is in, you know, it falling flat or my fear is in it getting backlash. And it's like, these aren't real things that have ever happened but my personality is very much like you said you're like you're a people pleaser I'm very much like a go with the flow peacemaker I cannot do confrontation and so I just kind of switched that mindset so instead of confrontation let's make this like how do we find a solution like let's make this a solutions-based issue so if we can just kind of refocus and, and mold our mindset into like just looking at it different from a different perspective. I think it's much easier to face that fear. That makes a lot of sense. And one thing that through these conversations I get to have with great people like yourself, it's, you know, uh, there's a thought that, you know, whenever you feel that resistance, whenever you feel that nervousness to something, the the stronger that resistance is, that should be telling you that that's a, that's more of what you should be doing. It's yeah. almost like, you know, the universe kind of telling you like, getting past that is actually what you're supposed to be doing. And I I wonder, someone recently said that it's really that fear of success. Like, what if I do this and it all goes right? That's That's so funny. Yes. I have actually said that I I have a fear of success. And I think it's about understanding yourself and doing work on yourself and understanding your goals and motivations. Um, I mean, I don't know if you know much about the Enneagram or if you know, you know, there's all kinds of personality tests. There's all Mm. kinds of things out there that can help us hone in on who we are so that we can use that to our advantage, right? Like what are our motivations? How do we function? How do we lean into the things that make us happy or bring us peace or bring us whatever we're looking for? And, um, I think so you surround yourself with people who you respect yeah. and they kind of bring you with them. Right. And you just, you like Dory, you just keep swimming, like just keep <laughs> taking that next step. Like I am not a big ideas person. Mm. I am the creative solutions person. So like, I love working with people who have these big, great ideas. Then we work back, you know, work back to today. And mm-hmm. then we create, we find ways to make that work all along the way. And so I think it it has a lot to do with knowing yourself and surrounding yourself with the right people that can kind of help you continue to get to know yourself, know your strengths and build what, whatever you're building towards your goals. We talked a little bit um, off air about your, your family and stuff. Did you have people mm-hmm. growing up that kind of helped with that, that were motivators or mentors for you? Or like when, 
did you have to kind of seek that out later? As far as motivators and mentors, I can think of lots of people in my family who I, I have a, a strong relationship with my mom and my, my stepdad, um, coworkers that I had along the way, friends I had along the way. But I think when you can have that symbiotic relationship with people. Who, for example, I have ADHD and my brain is like, I'm an out of the box thinker, right? So you've got the box. I'm like across the street chasing butterflies, <laughs> but my mom was very type A and inside the box. And I remember when we were, when I was younger, she would get so frustrated with me because like everything was a disorganized mess, but I was like, it makes sense to me. I get right. it. And so she was like, Oh, and I remember like having that safe place to have that conversation with her and say, my brain works differently than yours. It doesn't work like that. And I didn't know it was ADHD. I wasn't a diagnosed until I was an adult many, many years later. But my husband is like that. He's very linear, very inside the box. And so it's like, I'm motivated to like, please him probably mm -hmm. and like, make sure like he's comfortable in his space. But at the same time, like, because he can think inside that box, I can play outside the box right. and we sort of can overlap our common goal. And so when you surround yourself with people who think differently um, and have different perspectives, but you have the same goal, it's so much easier and smoother to sort of reach that next level. Well, and that just starts with the self-awareness, right? Like you are yeah. aware that yeah. this is my limitation, so... Yes. identifying and kind of partnering with people that were opposite helped. And I wasn't like born like this. It took me a lot of work. I'm 40, you know, and it's like probably in the last five years have I been like, oh, okay, this is not something to beat yourself up over because your brain works different. It's not something that makes you less than others. In fact, there's some things that I can do so much better than others because my brain works totally differently. Mm -hmm. And so it's just seeing what your strengths are and then leaning on people around you to sort of boost those strengths. And maybe they have strengths you don't have. And so you work together to get towards that, that goal, that vision. Do you think that you recognize your strengths or how was it other people kind of helping you identify? That's something I've, um, that's been going on in my I head mean, lately too. I, I definitely think when people give you a compliment, like I'm the mm. last person to be able to receive a compliment. Well, like, right. but if enough people say it, it starts to be your inner voice. Right. And so when I was younger, I remember reading something in my senior AP class and another student, her name's Nicole. I still remember her to this day. She was like, wow, you're a really great writer. And it was like, mm. that has stuck with me for years. And when I, my first year teaching, somebody said, you're so wonderful for the way that you collaborate. All these teachers were kind of working on in their own little silos. And now we've come together. I love that we do this. I'm like, oh, I'm really good at that. So it is like people pointing out and reflecting back your strengths. Um, but I mean, I think it's different for, for everybody. I just know the way that my brain works. I needed to like hear that affirmation in order to believe it. Yeah. And it's still kind of, it took a long time. I was teaching in a private school with one of my clients now. And she, this was years ago when like blogging was first a thing. And she was like, you should start a blog. You're such a great writer. And so I did. And when I started this business, I reached out to her and I said, I just want to thank you because you really pushed me forward and you always believed in me. And I just wanted to let you know, I'm doing it. I'm doing the thing. And turns out, Several months later, she's like, hey, can I hire you for this project? I'm like, oh, yeah. So it's just about, you know, being real with yourself. Keep moving forward. Keep reaching out to those people and keep them in your corner. Um, the way that I built this business was by just talking to people I know about what I'm doing and what I want, what my dreams and goals are. And I think a lot of people by nature want to help and want to be like, oh, I have a solution for that. And so the more you can network and the more that you can surround yourself with the kinds of people who have similar goals and visions, like, I feel like I can do anything I want. And I can do some things that I realized, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I've, I've yeah. found myself working with clients and saying, I'm going to try this because I've never done it before. And it's, it's something new. Let's see. Mm -hmm. And some of the time I'm like, oh, this is great. I want to really lean more into this. And that's how I kind of leaned into the ghostwriting piece. 
And then there's other things, um, some of the technical writing that I'm like, this just even writing for other teachers, you know, there's a thing called teacherpreneurs where they're selling their own content and they're selling curriculum. And I used, was oh. like, oh, that would be so easy. I know it like the back of my hand. Well, that's the problem. I know it inside and out. I'm like bored of oh. it already. It's like, you can only say so much before you're like, okay, I've said this 6 million times. Give me something that's challenging. And so what I love about where I'm at, it's like, I'm always jumping to that next challenge and it's scary the whole time, but it's also energizing and wonderful. And I have seen my growth across, you know, across the time that I've been doing this. And I'm like jazzed about where to go next, which is really new based, you know, compared to where I used to be, where I was like, oh my God, I have to get up and I have to go and do this thing that I don't want to do. <laughs> what? What is next? What does growth look like in the in the ghostwriting world? Um, I think it looks so my development from where I started. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like people who pick a word of the year, like where okay. you jump in. Um, instead of having uh like a New Year's resolution, right? You pick your word that you're gonna focus on. And so the first year it was rise. And I was like, I'm going to rise and I'm just going to say yes, keep rising to the occasion. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just going to go forward. And all of these opportunities sort of just started making themselves known. And I think it was because, I mean, I hate the word manifesting because it's like so overused, but you're so focused on it. You see those opportunities. Right. And then the next year, the word was aligned. And I started to really align my writing with the types of communities and the types of people I wanted to work with. And so some of those other uh, clients that were just noise started to go away. And I was like getting a little bit more focused. And this year, my word is a little bit different. It's kind because I feel like we as a society are exhausted. Like there's so much heavy stuff going on, right? Yeah. And so this year, I want to approach things with kindness and expecting the best in others and seeing the positives in others in hopes that that can be stronger and that can be more forward. And so I think what I've done for myself is built by focusing on those things is built the kinds of people around me where I see us growing together. Some people are the head honcho, right? But they have to have the support people behind them. Mm -hmm. And I always say, I'm like the best supporting actress. Like, I don't want to be the main, the main star. I want to be the person behind you. That's pushing you the like funny friend in the sitcom, right? That's just like, Hey, everybody look at this main guy. They're amazing. I, that gives me satisfaction. I don't want to put myself out there. That's mm -hmm. not who I am. And so um, where I'm going is I've got a lot, not a lot. I've actually got a handful of clients now who are doing these really big things. And it's like, we're creating something that's going to be bigger and have a lasting effect on the communities that they're serving. Um, a lot of the people that I work with are in the veteran communities and their families. Um, and then the homeowner space. So helping people get become home buyers and become property owners. I mean, you would, you wouldn't really think of that as something where people are like connecting and creating community, but if you really peel it back, that's what it is at its, at its base. Um, and some other, some other foundations and people who are just trying to create stronger communities. Cause I think, especially in this day and age where everything is online and we can become so isolated it's important to find new ways to create that human connection. So you find your growth, your success mm -hmm. is almost measured on, Hey, my clients are, they're being successful. That's what makes me happy and fulfilled. Yep. Yeah. That's because really cool. I think, I think it's not that they're successful. It's that we have a common goal and vision right. of serving others. And they're like the big, the big ideas people. And if I can get them to that finish line and that, they're successful and they're serving others. How many people have, have benefited along the way? Like that feels really good. And that's kind of what fuels me and just building on that positive energy. Um, because it is, it's real, it's real dark out there. Mm -hmm. And so trying to just find a way to, to make your mark in a way that 
leaves the world a little bit of a better place. There's endless ways to do that. And I think that that's, I think I have my core purpose, which was the same core purpose when I was a teacher as it is now. And it, even if I stopped writing, whatever I did next is still working towards that core purpose of connecting people and ideas to create communities. So no, that's, it's, it's just a, a different way of thinking about it that I wouldn't have considered. Like, yeah, it's easy to define success for yourself. Right. Uh, but when you think about it, well, in my work, it's, you know, reaching that common goal with somebody else. That's just really neat. And you talked about, um, you know, everything being online. Mm -hmm. How do you think that your writing helps people or build those connections on a personal level versus, like you said, kind of being isolated? Because it's very easy now to be in your own world and be online. Yeah. So how does, how do you tailor your writing to help people make those connections? I think at the end of the day, you want the other person who is seeing that message, reading that message to feel seen okay. and have them, you know, a lot of people who work in, in the copywriting space are, are saying, okay, we got to hit those pain points. The thing is, is when you reach a pain point for, for a client or a consumer, a lot of people do it in a way that makes them feel worse about themselves and makes them feel that sense of urgency. Like I have to do something about this because there's something intrinsically wrong. That doesn't feel good. Like I have right. to solve that problem is, can be approached in a way where, Hey, are you feeling this? And people are like, Oh yeah, I am feeling this. Do you need something that helps you feel like this? Oh yeah. Okay. And so just kind of making those baby steps of like, Hey, I've been there. And that storytelling of like, you're not alone. You're not weird for feeling this or thinking this or being in this space. You're actually going to have a solution here at the end of the day. Let's walk through it together. That feels much better than a lot of what I see out there, which is like, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Come do right. it better with us. Um, because then that feels like you're peeing in somebody's Cheerios, you know, like they, for, for, I mean, maybe that's not so family friendly, like you're yucking somebody's yum. If somebody's doing something and they're like, Hey, I like this, but I, I feel like I need some support. And somebody comes in and says, forget it. You're doing it wrong. You got to do it my way. All right that doesn't feel good. Like you need to, you need to create that ladder that builds up to, okay, this is where you come. You have some more needs. Let's get you there. Great job, by the way, for getting where you have and surviving what you have and, and doing what you've done, like empowering them to then say, okay, like you're the one in charge of taking that next step. And this is what can happen when you do. These are the positive. So kind of just driving it towards, again, like that common goal. Uh, but it, <laughs> it, goes back to, it goes back to your word of the year when you talk about being kind. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. that, and it's exciting for me to find other people that are using kindness to scale and grow and market themselves. Because yeah. so often you find like the, you get, people get in this competitive nature where it's mm -hmm. like, like you said, you have to, you know, piss in someone's Cheerios or do great yes. the business to, to make yourself feel better or look better. And it's like, I think long-term, doing it that way where you're building other people up and mm -hmm. um, I don't know, just going about it in a more wholesome way. is going to be better long-term for yourself. Well, I guess and I will say my, in my experience, just like not even when I'm writing for others, but when I'm looking for business for myself, I might have somebody come and say, Hey, I need this. Can you give it to me? And I'll say, okay, let's jump on a call. Let's talk it through. And I realize, you know what? That would be really, really good money but we're not the right fit. And I'm going to tell you why we're not the right fit because whatever, maybe we don't have the right goals. Maybe it's just an area that I don't have the expertise in, but let me connect you with my network that I've been building now, mm -hmm. because I know that this other person is the right fit for you. I think you'd love them. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that where I've said, Hey, consider this person. And then that original client comes back to me later or refer somebody to me because you've built that trustworthiness. You've built that, like, I'm not looking for the paycheck. I'm looking to serve you and like, make sure that you get what you need. And that goes a lot longer than me saying, okay, I'll take it. Which in the beginning I was, I was like taking anything I could right. get because I was just trying to build it. And I did a lot of mediocre stuff that I look back now and I'm like, Ooh, that wasn't good. 
Um, but I didn't, I didn't know that it wasn't like I was trying to, you know, not, not get them to where they needed to be. It just was a matter of learning as you go and yeah. growing it. And I don't know that I, I knew that I was doing that. I don't know that I was like, oh, I'm going to refer them to this person so that then they come back around to me. It's just something that sort of naturally progressed. And I keep seeing that pattern and I'm like, okay, so if I just keep like giving of myself, that energy comes back to me every time in some positive way. Um, yeah. When it's genuine, so, people can tell, right? I mean, yeah, they can tell if you're yeah. doing it for other reasons. Um, you know, this kind of gets us onto the, when you talk about that personal touch and those connections, like, mm-hmm. is that what, when people talk about the fear of AI taking over their jobs, especially mm-hmm. in copywriting, yeah. um, you know, with the, the emergence of things like chat GPT and things, mm-hmm. what, what's going to separate copywriters and allow them to continue to a, keep their jobs, but make those human connections in a world where it seems like, well, it's just as easy to ask this, this AI to do it for me. Absolutely. And I will say, I can only speak to, uh, I mean, and I do have a couple of corporate clients, but most of my clientele is small business, right? Mm -hmm. So in the corporate world, people are afraid of losing their jobs because people, AI is coming and it's going to make jobs obsolete in certain, in certain industries, in certain areas that I cannot speak to. I'm specifically and purposefully not part of the corporate world. (laughs) But when you bring down, when you break it down to that small business, AI is a tool that can give the person who is just, you know, that maybe they have a brick and mortar business, or maybe they have a small service based business, and they can afford to hire one copywriter. Well, AI gives you that opportunity to almost act like you have a copywriting team. You still need that head copywriter. Mm. That head copywriter is going to be the one that is able to look at what is created by AI and really refine it to your message and your goals. AI cannot do that on its own. Um, It just can't from what I've seen. And I love it. I use it. I I won't say daily, but I use it a lot, um, especially to refine if I need to do research on something that I'm just trying to kind of generate ideas, that ideas space, it really kind of helps give me that starting point. And then I can go back in and really make it something useful and valuable. And instead of me having to hire subcontractors to go out and do that research or go right. and outline it and go do that, and that's going to cost that client more, AI is really a very capable tool to use along with your existing expertise. Um, and I, I, people are, are, are nervous about it because, um, you know, there's a lot of chatter out there about it, how smart and capable it is. Um, and it makes me think of one of my favorite books. It's called the humans. I don't know if you're familiar with the author, Matt Haig, but, um, basically it's, this okay you got to follow me stay with me for a second it's this alien species that's far superior and they don't need to eat they are immortal and they are mathematically so superior that humans just seem kind of like ridiculous to them okay but there's this professor in cambridge who is very close to solving this mathematical formula that's going to give us lots and lots of answers to solving a lot of our problems And the aliens are like, oh, got to go and knock them out because they're not capable of handling this much power. And so long story short, what happens is this alien species, this guy comes down and learns what it is to be human and learns that, oh, this is what it's all about. Who cares about the mathematical piece about it? It's so important to have these connections and to experience love and to experience these big, deep feelings and goals and achievements. That's so much more valuable than anything a computer can do. And I kind of like look at AI as the same thing. What we have, the creativity that we have, the humanity that we have, no AI is ever going to be able to replicate that. Yes, AI is going to continue to get more powerful. AI is going to continue to be something we have to keep an eye on and inform ourselves about and be part of and keep the conversation going. But I think it's important that we 
promote people involving themselves in it instead of saying, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, pump the brakes. Like it's only as dangerous as we let it become. And if we are, allow ourselves to understand it, we can use it to our to our value and to our benefit. I like that explanation. Like, and we come we kind of talked earlier about, you know, the people screaming to pump the brakes are also the ones not invested in it. Like, <laughs> yeah. That, so you wonder what the motivation is, but I wonder if it'll almost bring humanity closer. I mean, obviously it's going to be kind of a longer term thing, but then once I guess the fear for everybody is like, it's, it's already improved so much in like a few months. Mm -hmm. So what has happened over the course of many years, but like you said, I think as humans, we'll always be able to recognize, um, at least you hope whenever you yeah. sit down and look at it. Cause like we talked to, like, if you were, if we're just scrolling and we're just quickly looking at pictures or, you know, messages, I think we can get duped um, mm -hmm. already. Um, yes. But it's, it's encouraging to know that like you're using it. It's like, Hey, it's good for this, this, yeah this aspect of my job, but it's, and it's not well, going to take over. And something that's really interesting is, um, of course, I have a lot of other copywriters and people in this space that I'm speaking to consistently and looking to, you know, bounce ideas off of, and we work collaboratively together. And kind of the common thread is we all use it enough to be able to recognize it where we see it. And we're like, oh my gosh, this is not good. Like, when people are creating entire courses and they're like, oh, right. I used AI, I hardly had to work. And I'm like, yeah, but we're reading your course. And the person on the other end of that who is paying for that course is not getting what they deserve because you didn't put yourself into it the way that, that, they, that, you, that they think that you have. And as we're reading it, we're like, this is not, this could be so much more powerful. This could be so much more powerful if you went back and let it evolve with your own input. And so I think AI, as far as when it comes to writing, it's a good starting point, but it's very inept as far as getting the big goals met. Um, and so it takes a human being who really understands so many, so many factors and so many minute messages that we're getting every day that changes the way that we look at the world. Then you put that into that AI created course and yeah. you've got somebody on the other end that's like, oh yeah, ding. And now it's something really powerful, but it's something that has to work cohesively and together. You can't just like set it and forget it. Oh, I was just going to say the more that we look at that, like the more that we're engaging in our space, we're, we can kind of see it in an instant. And I think I was telling you earlier, even with like AI photographer, pe people are people yeah. are getting duped, right? But if you're looking at it all the time, you'll see um, there's that, that one photo of the Pope and he's wearing like the Balenciaga coat or whatever. He's got four fingers. He's got four <laughs> fingers. Like, yes, again, if you're just looking quickly at it, the average person is going to be like, oh, that's the Pope. But then there's somebody who, this is their job. And they're like, no, that's BS. Like, let's right. move on. And as long as you have that voice, it's like, nope. There's so much out there that is faulty information, you know, like that we're getting all day, every day because we're moving at the speed of light, right? But as long as you have the, the larger voice of somebody who's like, this is why this is not right you can, most people can kind of reel that back in and go, oh, okay. It's not something to be scared of. Yes, it's something we should be aware of. And it's something that we should really be taking action with. But being scared of something like just keeps us from solving the problem, right. finding solutions. Well, isn't there some fear though, that most people aren't an expert copywriter aren't an expert photographer that could recognize that and we do live in that world of instant information yeah. like and that it can become super power like and most people uh, corporations maybe that are actually using it to write their mm -hmm. um, messaging maybe don't care that it's true to their their selves and their their value so right i guess the concern then is if there's that much influence on people mm -hmm. that don't recognize what it is, that's, that can be where the fear is coming from, right? Sure. Um, and I will say, I just recently on social media was looking at somebody posted headshots that were done by AI. Mm -hmm. 
And on first look, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, that's pretty good. That's not bad. Photographers were looking at it and they're like, this is not good. Right. I would have to spend two hours fixing those photos to make them to make them good. And then like I took a little bit of a closer look. I was like, yeah, that actually doesn't really look like this person. But if you're thinking about that solopreneur who's just getting started, she's not going to be able to afford a photographer who's going to be charging a certain amount of money for those headshots, right? Right. So this gives the opportunity for more people to have access, right? And when you have the big corporation who doesn't care about their consumer, no, it doesn't matter if they have AI or they have other people. They don't care about their consumer. So to what end does that, does, that's not AI's fault. You're just not buying it. You're not buying into the fear mongering. I'm trying to. I'm it. just not. I mean, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware and we shouldn't be involved and we shouldn't. I mean, people should be taking steps to make sure that there is some level of regulation so people don't get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for artists and copywriters and creatives, there is still so much space for us to do what we do well. I don't think it's a threat to our profession. I think it, I can understand why it really pisses artists off when they're like, yeah. this is my life's work and you're going to create that. That's terrible. It's kind of how I look at AI as a writer. I'm like, you you think that is what you're going to give your audience? <laughs> right. No, reel it back. Like, let's fix it. And so I can understand the frustration and like the sense of ick that people get with AI, but I just think it's, not something to I think it's something we evolve with so we evolve our approach um and the way that you know we ch choose to use it not use it and here's the thing there's going to be some some I already am seeing it some legal regulations coming right. where you're going to have to say this post was created with the help of AI I think that's great I think that's important and I still think that there is a place for it but the person on the other end of that transaction should know what is AI and what is not, whether that means, you know, somehow you are letting that reader or that, ex that person experiencing it say, this is AI. I think that's fair. And that's a good practice. And I think the people who participate in best practices would be doing that anyway. So um, I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm completely for AI and everybody should be using it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you know, it's this wonderful thing. It's certainly not a magic pill. It's just not something we should be afraid of or angry about. The more you're talking, it makes me think, you know, a hundred years ago at the forefront of the revolution, like the American revolution, like people had to be afraid that, well, there's no good, like all the phone operators aren't gonna have jobs. All the farmers aren't gonna have jobs anymore. All the mm -hmm. you know, milkmen don't have jobs. Like there was all these right? things that technology kind of took away and it just created more opportunities. So right. is, is this exactly. just going to create more jobs that we just don't yes. even know exist? You know? And I think we naturally evolve to find solutions. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have to experience some pain first and some disappointment. And there are people who are losing their jobs um, or losing their positions, you know, especially like people higher up on the corporate ladder who are like, we're paying way too much for you when AI yeah. can be doing this. That's scary. But if you've made it all the way up that ladder, you're you you have the capability to evolve and to figure out how to adjust to move on to the next thing and grow bigger. And it may not look like what you expected it to, but I think we grow through pressure, right? Diamonds are created, you know, from tons and tons of pressure. That's why we feel scared, right? When we're growing, because it's a little bit of pressure. And I don't know. I, I hope I don't eat my words one day when <laughs> like we're all being run by, by robots. But yeah. I, in this moment right now, I don't see AI as an adversary. I see it as a tool that has some faults. <laughs> that, makes, that makes sense. And I guess I'll start to transition away from AI because we, we've talked a lot about why someone would want like to be true to their message and stuff. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of small businesses, like even myself for a long time, it's like, we weren't even putting out a message really. Right. So yeah. why is it important? Cause like the, the, my thought is, well, cheap 
access to like copywriting, like an AI would be beneficial mm -hmm. for some small mom and pop businesses. But if it's mm -hmm. not truly getting to the, to their goals and their mission, how does, how do you reconcile that? Does that make sense? So, a, cause your recommendation would be that a small business should be putting out a message, right? Right. But then, um, if they're limited, maybe in the resources, how can they work to, to use what's available? So or I think you need to hire a person who, instead of having to hire a, a marketing team, right. you can hire fewer people and hire strong leaders in your marketing who use AI to help save you money. And if you hire the team members who understand AI or who use it and have evolved with it, they're going to be able to tell you exactly how they're going to save your company money in the long run so that you can put that money towards your larger vision and your larger goal, right? Okay. Because the goal is not to pay a marketing team. It's to get the right marketing out the easiest way possible so that you can meet whatever that next, that larger goal is, right? So I think it's, it's all a balance. You know, yeah. I'm not saying you can do it all on your own. Yeah. If you're running a mom and pop shop, you need to do some marketing. You're going to have to hire a person, a human being. You're not just going to be able to be like, Hey, let me put this all into AI and walk away from it. Um, for starters, there's so much information through AI that is incorrect um, or invalid or yeah. culturally uh, offensive even <laughs> or in insensitive um, and because yeah insensitive sure um and so and there's times where i've used ai and i've i've you know just asked it a question and i'm like whoa um and i actually just posted something on my social media it was i live in savannah georgia there was a local savannah area news writer who was saying uh so i used ai to tell me all about savannah and this is what i learned and he mm -hmm. kind of walked through all of the steps of like, hey, this was a great start, but this information is no longer correct. Those places have closed. This information is great, but it kind of only scratches the surface. What I would do is kind of go in and, and, and pull out more of that information. However, this piece of information here just saved me 45 minutes. So it's like, you know, there's a balance there. You need a okay. human being who has that creative vision on the other side using that AI. But AI is so, such a great resource for people who are low on resources, <laughs> short right. on resources, especially for their marketing. I never thought about that. Like if you, if you were to, cause I've obviously used it. It's like, but if you pull out the entire thing and actually did some research on each of the you know, maybe subsections, mm -hmm. like how much of that information is truly accurate or um... not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pulling it from, you know, internet information. I mean, exactly. it, that's the only access it has. It can't walk the street and talk to people and find out. Well, what's going on. and it can't understand your, the specific needs of your audience. What they will think is funny is not the same thing uh... somebody else would think is funny. What they, want out of this service or product might be different than what these other marketing bros over here are are offering. And so you have to take it and really mold it to fit your, your message. And honestly, sometimes when I've used AI, it has taken me longer than it would have if I had just done it myself. But there are also times where I'm like, okay, I don't even know where to start with this, but mm -hmm. we've got to get it done on this deadline give me something to start with. And then I'm like, oh, that gives me this idea. Oh, I can go there. And then I kind of giggle as I see all of these inaccuracies and I'm like, okay, we'll take that out. Right. Um, or is that true? I'm not sure. I have to go research it. No, it's not true. That just took me 20 extra minutes. So there's a balance there. And I think the more you we use it, the better we learn how to, to manage that balance. Um, but I think it's really cool. <laughs> what, what's your process look like when you're working with a new client to help define what their their mission or their goal is if you're writing for someone in their yeah. voice you always have to kind of know them or yes what trying and to do we well. do there is a whole bunch of chatter and and paperwork we do before we even get started where we're identifying those pain points we're identifying that ideal consumer avatar which is basically who's the person on the other end about how old is that person are they male or are they female or are they 
of a certain age? Are they in a certain socioeconomic level? Tell me everything about this. And, and then you're talking to that one person. Because if you're trying to talk to everybody, you're talking to nobody. And a lot of my clients, I see they're trying to like, they're like, well, it could be this and it could be this and it could be this and it could be this. I'm like, yeah, but you're giving people whiplash focus because once you have that main focus of who you're talking to, exactly what they need, where they're coming from, you're going to not only speak to that person, but it's going to be a lot more clear for the people on the outliers who are like, well, that doesn't exactly describe me, but this is interesting. Right. Okay. Like I'm on board now because this message is so clear and concise and like specific. So no, I'm bad about um, that. I feel like, cause you can feel like, well, I want to talk to everybody cause I don't want to yeah. alienate anybody, but you're exactly, right. you, but with, well, by doing that, then it makes it hard for anybody to even realize what, who, what you're talking about. Exactly. And it just kind of comes off as generic. And I've noticed that a lot yeah. of AI sort of does that so in order to program ai you have to be very clear about who your audience is and also what your voice is which takes a lot of work um and unfortunately my issue with ai is it it like starts to understand your voice and create the same kind of content but i have so many different clients that i'm like hey okay can you write something along these lines and it'll be in a different client's voice because that was the last piece of work I was working on. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So we have to make constant adjustments to really hone it in. So in that case, I'm like, throw out the AI and let me sit down old school and really break this down. And then I'm just going to talk to that person mm. as if it was you and me. And now I'm breaking it down. I know your age. I know your industry that you work in. I know your, your pain points. Now I can talk to you just like this podcast, right? I'm talking to you, but how many people do you have listening that are like, okay, I'm not exactly like Jordan, but these are some questions I have too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you start to see that back and forth. Right. And so then when I take Jordan's uh, testimonials or that feedback. And I put that back through other people are like, well, I really like Jordan. So I get this now, like I'm interested, I'm on board. And so it takes just starting in that one place and really honing in and being really clear and, and just consistently moving, taking those small steps towards whatever that end goal is. I don't think you gave yourself enough credit for um, speaking. So I think you break things down pretty well. Well, I was a teacher. <laughs> And this, don't get me wrong. I like, I don't know if you can tell, I, it's hard to shut me up, but um, I enjoy speaking. It's the public speaking. Right. And it's like that level of, I have this whole audience that's looking at me and I freak out and like my mind goes completely blank. But if I can just be in a small room with people who I know and trust, mm -hmm. you're not going to get me to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> But if say we were on a Zoom call and there's 30 other people on this call, you're not going to hear me say very much at all. But that just goes um, back to that. You're a little bit more introverted and like you don't want to be the main yeah. focus. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's there's like a spectrum, right? Yeah. Of of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. And there's like some things about me that are very extroverted in small groups or like right. with one-on-one -on -one. I will tell you my entire life story and you're going to be like wow that was way too much information and so like it's just finding where I am on that spectrum and then connecting with people the way that they need to be connected with as well so do you do like video in your marketing efforts or is it all oh lord um <laughs> I, you mean at my, my specific business like for your or business, yeah. yes. Okay. Cause for clients, yes, we do video, right. but for myself, I did a lot of it in the beginning, especially when I was just starting. Um, and I will be honest, I burned out on it. I mm -hmm. liked it. It's fun to create reels, but it's just not what gives me like the energy and the passion. And so, um, I, I did it really, really like religiously for, like in 2021, 2022, for sure. And then this year, I've just kind of scaled it way back and it feels good <laughs> and it's okay. Like, it's okay for me to take that break. And I see other people's reels and I'm like, oh, I really want to do that. But then I'm like, I can't, like, I have to stay focused on what's going on right now. And right now I'm working on 
<laughs> ghostwriting projects, which I can't really share who the clients are. Right. I can't really share what their message is until it comes out. So it's like, how do I, I can't, for my brain, I can't switch back and forth. Um, but what I used in my social media was not to my ideal client. It was to my ideal referral partner. So mm. I wasn't exactly saying, Hey, th sometimes I would, Hey, this is how I can write for you. And this is how I can give you what you need. But I realized I don't want to cold pitch somebody or meet somebody with no like soft introduction. I much prefer somebody recommend me to somebody else right. or somebody to say, Hey, I met you at this marketing event or this networking event. And it was great talking to you. Let's see that down that further. That feels more natural to me. And so I created that kind of community on social media, Instagram specifically. Um, I'm a little bit on LinkedIn. I was a lot more when I was trying to build this business, but I just, I'm, I'm not there as much as I probably should be. Um, but on Instagram specifically, uh, there's a lot of female entrepreneurs in the online space specifically who could be my, uh, referral partners. And so we build those true, honest friendships. And then my reels kind of talk to them. And it's like, Hey, I get this, that you're feeling this. Cause I feel it too. Oh my gosh. Isn't that funny? Let's have a laugh together. And then when you hear about a client who needs this copy work, I'm the first person who's front of mind for you. So that's kind of how I've used my marketing to work for me. Um, I did a lot of blogging in the beginning. Um, and I would highlight community members who were doing things in their communities to serve others and with with like no agreement at the end I was just like hey I just want to highlight you I want to highlight what you're doing I think what it is is cool and then I can put it on my channel you can put it out on your channel and it's another piece of marketing and several of those people came back and ended up working with me and being long-term clients of mine and that wasn't like I didn't go in with that in mind I went in open to that like hey if we ever uh, end up working together, that would be great. Or if you ever hear of somebody who might need these services, that would be great. But the idea was promoting that community and like building, helping them serve their communities better. So that was kind of where my marketing yeah. for myself has come, but you'll hear a lot of, you know, there's that old hairdressers always have their hairs a mess because they are busy working on other people, making them perfect. I feel like that's, how my marketing and copywriting is because I'm so focused on my clients. I'm tired. I have so much stuff that's like partially done or halfway done. And I just lose the energy for it right. because I don't want to do anything for myself. I want to do things for other people. And it's like, that's not where my energy is best spent. I think eventually things will get done. And as I evolve, those things might turn into other kinds of projects that I can push forward. But right now it's, it's, I'm in a phase where I'm super focused on my clients and what they're doing that I haven't reeled it back and looked at myself in, in a good few months. <laughs> well, that could be a good thing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's felt great. I have to say, because, <laughs> and social media can be a dark, a dark place too. Yeah. Um, and, and a tough place. So you have to set boundaries and, um, and that's what it started from. I was exhausted because after the holidays, I was like, I just can't right now. Mm -hmm. be in this place and then do what I do successfully and well. So I made the choice to let the social media sort of go and let those other background projects sort of go so that I could focus on the things that brought me that positive energy. Are the ghost writing projects like more, like even longer form like books? Is that mm -hmm. what would be like right now? Writing? I'm working on two books. Um, generally when I ghost write, it's often, um, like a multi-tiered thing. Like maybe we'll do, um, some articles or a series of something or an ebook or a deliverable of some sort. Um, that's where I started with that. Okay. Um, and then it turned into bigger and larger projects. And I really yeah. love doing a book because it's like, it's a long-term commitment and it's just so satisfying to like watch it go from from an idea that somebody else has and like build it into a book and then marketing that book. And I've just learned so much. And I think I'm, I'm a lifelong learner who's like eager to just always be doing something new and always kind of changing up 
what I do. So I think this will always be an evolution. I may not always ghost write books, but that's probably my favorite thing that I'm doing right now. Um, and the other thing that I really enjoy doing is like that whole content strategy where I said like, you've got a big five-year plan or a three-year plan, right? So how do we walk that back? You know, like we plan backwards into where we are today. And then I love walking them through and creating those creative solutions as we go. And as the world sort of changes and, and conversations shift, I love the idea that we're going to get there, but it's not ever going to look like how we planned and, or how we thought it was going to look. And by making these maneuvers, it ends up being even better and it ends up being more satisfying. What's that ghost writing <laughs> process look like? Is it like someone's giving you, Hey, here's what I want to write about, or here's like a bunch of, um, like their own writing and then you're kind yeah. of converting it? Like how yes. does that work? It can, it can vary. I mean, every, mm. every person is different. There's some people who are like, I just want to write a book about this and I haven't started and I don't know how to start. Okay. And then there's other people who are like, I have a story to tell. This is that exact story. I just need help bringing it out. And then there's people, like you said, who may have some writing or who may have some content. They're like, I just need to organize this. And so I'm pretty good at, meeting people where they're at and then coming up with a, a specific solution for what they need. And so it always includes conversations like this. We do zoom calls, we do uh, an outline. So we'll create an outline usually. And then we do like two hour calls where I just ask them and interview questions. They'll answer them the best they can. As we go, we start developing these new ideas for what we can add into the book or what we may want to take out and create as a marketing material because it doesn't quite fit that specific message, but it's an, it's a, it's an adjacent message that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just, um, it's an evolution. Every, you know, it, it doesn't ever look the same twice. There's a skeleton that always looks the same. You know, we go, from our initial meetings, then we do an outline, then we do the chapters, um, you know, we probably have sections and then we go back the way that we edit it. And, and then it kind of starts to get a little bit shakier. Do they have a publisher? If yes, it goes one way. If no, it goes another way if they need to find a publisher. And so as we go along, I'm learning all of these great new things and right. tools and strategies too. And so I think it's a really, I think that's why I enjoy it so much because it's an always evolving, always moving. I'm never bored. It never looks like I expected it to, but it always is just a little bit better. And kind of helping that person who had that original idea see that through and, and feel uh, that sense of satisfaction that like they did this thing. Like that's the ultimate, like that's the ultimate satisfaction for me. And that's pretty cool that someone can just say, hey, this is something I want to do, but I don't know how to get started. And they can just say, help me do it. And you yeah. can take them through that whole process. Well, and I will say probably, again, being a teacher really helped, yeah. right? Because there, there is a concrete skeleton process in the writing process. So we can take that, we can apply it to your situation, and we can see what happens, and we can build this new thing. And that's really cool. It's really fun. What's What's one piece of advice or something that you apply to your life that you would want the listeners to take away from, from this conversation? I would say do the things that feel uncomfy. <laughs> I say that all the time. If it do, if it feels uncomfortable, it means you're growing and um, don't be afraid of making mistakes. And I used to say this to my kids, my students too. It's like mistakes are where like the good stuff is because you learn from those mistakes and you're like, Oh, I'm even stronger and even better now. And I'll never do that. And sometimes we have to learn the hard way. And so just jump in and do it scared and, and be uncomfortable and just keep putting one foot in front of the other and stay focused on that goal. And you're going to be fine. No, that's awesome. I, th I think that's something that um, I'm learning as a parent as well as like yeah. giving kids a safe oh, space to fail, like is yes. the key to it all. Cause sometimes and that's it's all so they're hard. Learn. Yeah. yeah. And it's so hard as parents because you're like, oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be yes. rough. <laughs> yeah. Um, but and I ha I'm often reminding my husband of that too. Like, um, our son has autism. He's nine years old. And he is developmentally probably in the like five to six year old range. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's kind of like <laughs> 
he's just like a baby giraffe in life. It's just like real awkward for him. Right. And again, my husband's like very linear. He's in the box thinker. And I'm like, just take a, take a breath. It's going to be okay. He's going to learn by, by making this mess of his, of it, you know, of his situation, how to get out of it. But like, we have to give him that beat. We have to give him that mm. minute to, to solve it himself. Um, and we've kind of really, because my husband's so type A and I'm so out of the box, like we make a pretty good team. And so there's times when like, we have to tap out and let the other one take I'm over sure. and vice versa. But it's, uh, it's been a great learning experience because there's well, no perfect parent out there. Woo. Well, no. No. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. you want to protect your kids, but then more, even more so when they have special needs. I mean, I can't imagine. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's why I ended up here where I'm at because I didn't have the energy to, to do that with other people's kids. I mm. hate to say it like nah. in that, that sounds cold. And I loved that. I called them my kids. I loved every student I ever had. Even the ones that drove me crazy had a love for them, but that's a lot of energy that I just didn't have when I came home to my, at the time, kindergarten son, who was right. really had his own struggles. Um, and then COVID happened and it was like, we were home with him all the time. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so it was a learning experience and there was a lot of, a lot of bumps, but yeah. I'm really, I'm really proud of myself for making that decision and putting him first. Um, and I told myself like, I can always go back to teaching when he yeah. grows up, like I can always do this, but right now he's a little kid one time. And so he is my priority. And I think <clears throat> that's a big part of my success too. Like yeah. money is important, right? Just to function. But like, that's never the end goal for me. I've never been like, oh, I need to scale to this much. My goal is have enough time and energy to spend with my kid while he's little so that I can be the best mom that I can be. Hmm. And how do I do that? Through doing this other thing really well and being as good at it as I can and being able to to mold it around my schedule and my needs. Um, so that like I can do this and tomorrow I'll get started working in the morning and then I can go to his Easter party. And then, you know, when he comes home, we can, we can do things that I never could have done when I was working full time as a teacher. So uh, hey, I'm proud of you too. Cause you not only Thanks. took the leap and did it, but you, I think it's cool that you defined what success means because for a lot of people, that's the yeah. hard part. Well, and I really got clear on it when I was looking for a coach because a lot of coaches in my space are coaches to help you like I said scale to an agency or scale to this I was like no this isn't about growing bigger than I am this is about maintaining something wonderful mm -hmm. so that I can live my life and have this like my focus is not my work my work gives me the energy and the passion and the and the challenge that I need in my daily life to feel like a successful human and then I can stop it and focus on my kid, which is a whole other mess. <laughs> yeah. Now, hey, yeah. Mich Michelle, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. And it was a an awesome conversation. Thank you so much. It was great. Mm -hmm.